Welcome to this slide presentation in honor of the two Baha'i holy days related to Abdul Baha, the ascension of Abdul Baha and the day of the covenant. Both of these holy days will be commemorated in November. We've put together a comprehensive overview of the life of Abdul Baha. The PowerPoint presentation contains 110 slides using historic photos. During the time that Abdul Baha lived, photos weren't common. So in many cases, photos were not available for the events and the people in Abdul Baha's life. We tried to restrict the narrative to include only events and people where we were able to find a photo. I think we included only one individual where there was no existing photo. Two major themes emerged as we put together the program. The first theme was Abdul Baha's complete self-abnegation. From the first dawn of each day, on into the dark of night, he sought no rest. On a daily basis, he visited the poor, met with government and religious leaders, administered to the nascent faith, and wrote thousands of letters to believers in the East and West. The second theme had to do with his spiritual magnetism charm and spiritual power. He was desperately sought out by a vast array of people of influence, intellectual leaders, religious leaders, political leaders, socialites and celebrities. People traveled vast distances to seek his love, his wisdom and his blessings. While traveling abroad and with no publicity or advertising campaign, he filled halls, theaters, churches, temples and synagogues and in the interim hours greeted long lines of people waiting for his personal counsel wherever he went. Abdul Baha, son of Baha'u'llah, was born in Tehran on May 23rd, 1844, the same day that the Baha'i dispensation began with the declaration of the Bab. He was born to a noble and aristocratic family. From the age of eight, when his father was first imprisoned, he shared the poverty and exile that ensued. The imprisonment of his father when Abdul Baha was eight years old greatly affected him as a child. Baha'u'llah was imprisoned in the infamous subterranean dun dungeon, the Siachal in Tehran. In a single day, Baha'u'llah lost all his lands, his houses and furnishings, and then after four months chained to the floor of the prison was banished to Baghdad. Once Abdul Baha accompanied his mother to visit his father in the prison. Abdul Baha described how, quote, I saw a dark, steep place. We entered a small, narrow doorway and went down two steps, but beyond those, one could see nothing. In the middle of the stairway, all of a sudden, we heard Baha'u'llah's voice Do not bring him in here. And so they took me back. Abdul Baha was banished along with his father and the Holy Family from Iran to Baghdad for 10 years. Abdul Baha was 18 years old when they left. From Baghdad, they were again banished to Constantinople, now called Istanbul. Again, they were exiled to Adrianople, now called Idirne. And the final exile was to Akka in Palestine, now Israel. Abdul Baha was 24 years old when they arrived in Akka. Each banishment was the result of Baha'u'llah's growing influence and popularity and the threat perceived by the government and clergy. This is a map showing the four exiles. It explains briefly how Abdul Baha was a political prisoner from the age of eight until he was 64 years old when he was finally freed in 1908 by the Young Turk Revolution. When Baha'u'llah died in 1892, Abdul Baha was appointed through his father's will as head of the Baha'i faith, the authorized interpreter of Baha'u'llah's writings. So he was the center of the Baha'i faith from 1892 until his passing in 1921. So from the age of 48 to 77. He was also the exemplar of the teachings of Baha'u'llah. His life was an example for all of us to follow. In Adrianople, or Adirne, Abdu'l-Baha was regarded as the sole comforter of his family. 
At this point, Abdul Baha was known by the Baha'is as the master and by non-Baha'is as Abbas Effendi. It was in Adrianople that Baha'u'llah referred to his son as the mystery of God. The title, Mystery of God, indicates, according to Baha'is, that Abdul Baha, while not a manifestation of God, but is in the person of Abdul Baha the inc incompatible characteristics of a human nature and superhuman knowledge and perfection have been blended and are completely harmonized. Baha'u'llah gave his son many other titles, such as the mightiest branch, the branch of holiness, and the center of the covenant. Abdul Baha was at this point noted for having black hair which flowed to his shoulders, large blue eyes, rose through alabaster colored skin, and a fine nose. At the age of 24, Abdul Baha was the chief steward to his father and the outstanding member of the Baha'i community. Baha'u'llah and his family were in 1868 exiled to the penal colony of Akka, Palestine, where it was expected that the family would perish. Arrival in Akka was distressing for the family in exiles. They were greeted in a hostile manner by the surrounding population and his sister and father fell dangerously ill. They were incarcerated in what Baha'u'llah referred to as the most great prison. This is a quote from Abdul Baha regarding their prison life. He said, we had no communication whatever with the outside world. Each loaf of bread was cut open by the guard to see that it contained no message. All who believe in the Baha'i manifestation, children, men, women, were imprisoned with us. There were 150 of us together in two rooms and no one was allowed to leave the place with the exception of four persons who went to the bazaar to market each morning under guard. The first summer was dreadful. Akka is a fever-ridden town. It was said that a bird attempting to fly over it would drop dead. The food was poor and insufficient. The water was drawn from a fever-infected well and the climate and conditions were such that even the natives of the town fell ill. The intense heat, malaria, typhoid, and dysentery attacked the prisoners so that all men, women, and children were sick at one time. There were no doctors, no medicines, no proper food, and no treatment of any kind. I used to make broth for the people, and as I had much practice, I make good broth, said Abdul Baha laughingly. Over time, Abdul Baha gradually took over responsibility for the relationships between the small Baha'i exile community and the outside world. It was through his interaction with the people of Akka that the innocence of the Baha'is became known and thus the conditions of imprisonment were eased. Four months after the death of Mirza Mid Midi, Abdul Baha's brother, the family moved from this prison to the house of Abud. The people of Akka started to respect the Baha'is and in particular, Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha was able to arrange for houses to be rented for the family. The family later moved to the house of Abdullah Pasha and then to the mansion of Mazrai. And finally, to the mansion of Baji around 1879 when an epidemic caused the inhabitants to flee. Abdul Baha soon became very popular in the penal colony of Akka and Myron Henry Phelps, a wealthy New York lawyer and religious writer described how a crowd of human beings, Syrians, Arabs, Ethiopians, and many others all waited to talk and receive Abdul Baha on a daily basis. Now we're talking about his building projects. One of Abdul Baha's many accomplishments was the building of the Shrine of the Bab. Baha'u'llah chose the site on Mount Carmel just above Ben Gurion Avenue. Abdul Baha bought the land, set the cornerstone, and supervised the building of the mausoleum. He also arranged for the remains of the Bab to be transferred from Iran to Haifa. The dome was added later during Chogi Effendi's life and finished in 1952. 
the 19 terraces were completed in 2001. In addition to the building of the Shrine of the Bob, Abdul Baha started to put into execution two different projects, the restoration of the House of the Bob in Shiraz, Iran, and the construction of the Baha'i House of Worship built in the city of Iskabad, then part of Russia and now part of Turkmenistan. Construction began in 1902 and was completed in 1908. The First Pilgrims. Phoebe Hurst, who was a philanthropist, feminist, and the mother of William Randolph Hurst, organized the first group of Western pilgrims to arrive in Akka in 1898. After this first group, pilgrims continued to come from England, France, the United States, and Canada, as well as other countries, and the news of the Baha'i faith spread. And they all wanted to spend time with Abdul Baha. During these early years, feasts and holy days were observed, both for the pilgrims and for the public. Next, we'll talk about his written works. Abdul Baha wrote over 27,000 tablets, of which only a fraction have been translated into English. His works fall into two groups. The first group are his direct writings, and the second group are his lectures and speeches, as noted by others. The first group includes The Secret of Divine Civilization, written around 1875, A Traveler's Narrative, written around 1886, Memorials of the Faithful, and a large number of tablets written to various people, including various Western intellectuals, such as Auguste Farrell. He also wrote the Tablets of the Divine Plan, of course, in the Will and Testament of Abdu'l-Bahá. The second group includes Some Answered Questions, a collection of transcriptions of table talks given by Abdu'l-Bahá in Akka between 1904 and 1906 in response to questions posed by Laura Dreyfus Barney, an American Baha'i resident in Paris and first published in 1908. And Paris Talks, Abdul Baha in London and Promulgation of Universal Peace, which are talks given by Abdul Baha in Paris, in London, and the United States. Now we'll talk briefly about a typical day in the Holy Land. Every few days, Abdul Baha came to Haifa to super, supervise the construction activities of the Shrine of the Bab, and he would stay a few days. Upon his arrival, he usually visited the pilgrim house where both Baha'is and non-Baha'is who had received news of his arrival would already have gathered in anticipation of a meeting, which would last until late at night. In the morning, the master began the day by visiting the notables of Haifa, visiting the poor and showering them with his love and generosity. This was one of his essential and customary tasks. He visited each and every indigent home, bestowing gifts of love, concern, medical instructions, and generous financial aid. He spent much time supervising the construction work on the Shrine of the Bob. He purchased a number of tracts of land on Mark, Mount Carmel, which was at the time barren scrubland. He spent large sums for the maintenance work of the main road passing through the area as a generous gesture towards the development and growth of the city of Haifa. He worked closely with city officials on this. And while dealing with these complexities, he was constantly assailed by the intrigues, the falsehoods, and the attacks initiated and sustained over two decades by his jealous half-brother, Muhammad Ali, and other covenant breakers. And now to his travels. As time went on, the pilgrims who came to the Holy Land were urging Abdul Baha to visit them in their communities when he was free to do so. At the age of 67, Abdul Baha set out on a series of journeys to the West. And the purpose of supporting the fledgling Baha'i communities and personally presenting the Baha'i teachings to the West where the Baha'i faith was not well known. We're going to look more closely at his travels to the West, but a brief overview is what is that he left Palestine in 1910 for Egypt and stayed one year. 
followed by, by five months in France and Great Britain the first time, back to Egypt, and then he left Egypt on March 25th, 1912 to travel by boat, the RMS Cedric to North America, where he spent eight months in the US and Canada, then back to Great Britain, France, Austria, Hungary, Germany, and finally back to Haifa in Palestine on December 5th, 1913. Every day of his over 33 year journey, I'm sorry, every day over his three year journey, he was very busy. We'll mention a few highlights to give the idea of kinds of things that he did wherever he went. While in Great Britain, he stayed at Lady Bloomfield's. He was interviewed by numerous newspapers and individuals. He was asked to give many talks in homes, churches, synagogues, universities, societies, and other places. He was asked to speak at the city temple by Reverend Reginald Campbell. Albert Wilberforce, the archdeacon of Westminster, asked him to address the congregation of St. John the Divine in, in Westminster. Almost every day when he wasn't speaking to large audiences or news reporters, he was seeing individuals who came morning, noon, and night to meet and speak to him. Ezra Pound, who was an expat poet and critic requested an interview where he was planning to interrogate Abdul Baha. After the interview, Ezra Pound said he didn't ask any questions as it seemed impertinent. He was in Paris for nine weeks and he gave talks every day and sometimes several talks each day. A color portrait of Abdul Baha was taken while he was in Paris. The RMS Cedric is the ship that brought Abdul Baha to New York. He boarded the Cedric in Alexandria, Egypt, and arrived in New York City on April 11th, 1912. Again, comes up the idea that with no advertisement, no publicity, or notification, it was Abdul Baha's magnetism which incited people to arrange for him large audiences. During the voyage, the officers of the ship asked Abdul Baha to address a public meeting which they arranged in the lounge. Among the large number of people attending were the consuls of Russia and Italy who conversed regularly with the master afterwards. Several newspapers announced Abdul Baha's arrival. A few of the headlines read, prophet of Baha'i is here, banish 50 years, leader of Baha'i here, Persian philosopher favors women's suffrage and will talk peace. Abdul Baha here to convert America to his peace doctrine. Persian teacher of world peace arrives, and from the New York Times, simply Abdul Baha here. As soon as he arrived in the US, he was a sensation. And it is hard to convey how word spread so quickly and how he was sought after morning, noon, and evening, wherever he went. The pattern for all of his days in New York began with a continuous flows of, flow of visitors in the morning wanting to see him. Sometimes as many as 150 people would be lined up on the street at a time, every, each one receiving a measure of his love. Reverend How Howard Colby Ives, a Unitarian minister, said of his, his experience first meeting Abdul Baha. He said, the atmosphere pervading the room filled with spiritual vibrations beyond anything I have ever known. Here at last was my father. What earthly relationship could equal this? And life has never quite been quite the same since. Howard Colby Ives later became a Baha'i. Usually in the afternoon, Abdul Baha would address a large audience numbering in the hundreds, either in someone's home or in a hall. And in the evening, usually a dinner with a talk numbering in the hundreds or a thousand or more. The many people he met, the many talks he gave, and the many lives he touched are too numerous to mention. One famous talk he gave was at the Church of the Ascension on Fifth Avenue to more than 2,000 people. Khalil Gibran, the, the famous literary figure, was very much affected by his meeting with Abdu'l-Baha. The pencil portrait 
Khalil Gibran did of Abla Baha appeared in major exhibitions in New York and Paris. Here's a brief look at two days of his schedule while in Washington, DC. On Tuesday, April 23rd, 1912, in the morning, he spoke to over a thousand students at Howard University to a standing ovation. Then he went to the Persian embassy for a reception luncheon in his honor. While there, he gave private interviews to Admiral Perry and Alexander Graham Bell. At the luncheon, there were place cards at the table. Abdul Baha shuffled the place cards, making sure that Lewis Gregory, a Baha'i African American lawyer, was by his side at the place of honor. Next, he went to Mrs. Agnes Parsons' reception. Agnes Parsons was a Washington, D.C. socialite who went so far as to have a house built exclusively for Abdul Baha's visit. Although Abdul Baha had already rented a house, he accepted her invitation out of kindness. She had a reception each afternoon for him, where hundreds of prominent members of society were invited to meet him, diplomats, scientists, and socially prominent people. After the reception, he went to the large Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Church, where he spoke to a packed audience. The following day, Wednesday, he attended a children's reception in the morning, followed by Mrs. Parsons' reception, then to the home of Mrs. Andrew J. Dyer, an African-American and prominent Baha'i. Unfortunately, no photo of her is available. He spoke on unity and the oneness of humanity. After that, he went to the home of Alexander Graham Bell, who had invited him to meet his friends and fellow scientists. He spoke to them and answered their questions on science until midnight, then a late meal was served. The next day, more interviews, more talks, another reception at the Parsons home, and a large reception at the Turkish embassy. In the evening, former President Teddy Roosevelt came to the Parsons home to meet him. Roosevelt was later quoted in the New York Daily Tribune, January 12, 1912 saying he was wonderfully impressed by the teachings of Abdul Baha. While in America, he also met with the president of Stanford, Stanford University, David Starr Jordan. Also Jane Addams, the founder of Hull House, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1931. He met Andrew Carnegie and later sent him a letter regarding the poor. He met with the speaker, of the House of Representatives, Champ Clark, and the governor of New York, John Alden Dix. He met the secretary of the US Treasury, Lee McClung, who breakfasted with Abdul Baha and wept when he said goodbye. Afterwards, McClung said, quote, I felt as though I was in the presence of one of the great old prophets, Elijah, Isaiah, Moses. No, it was more than that, Christ, no, now I have it. He seemed to be my divine father. Albert Hubbard was one of the major newspaper columnists of the period. He wrote the following regarding Abdul Baha's visit to Washington, D.C. He wrote, when Abdul Baha went to Washington and swept through the Capitol, even the Supreme Court saw fit to adjourn. The House, the same, and the Senate, for a while at least, forgot matters of investigation. When Abdul Baha went to the White House, one might have thought that he was going with the intent to take possession of it, but his is not a kingdom of this world, so far as a desire to rule is concerned. When he visited the Bowery, he insisted that the people from high society who came to see him should accompany him there. He always took money with him whenever he visited the poor and handed out coins to all. President Taft, who was the only Unitarian president, asked Abdul Baha to address the ladies of President Taft's All Saints Unitarian Church to a room completely filled. In Chicago, he spoke at Jane Addams Hull House. Hull House was mentioned before. It was one of the earliest settlement houses in Chicago. It had innovative social, educational, and artistic programs, which became a model for almost 500 settlement houses. 
by 1920. It was a social welfare, welfare project for helping the poor to become educated, to educate and empower women, to break down barriers to social and economic class, and to improve living conditions in the slums that surrounded Hull House. He spoke at the NAACP National Convention in Chicago. W.E.B. Du Bois published Abdu'l-Baha's entire speech from the NAACP conference in the June edition of The Crisis and featured another article and large picture of him the following month in his Men of the Month section. Also while in Chicago, Abdu'l-Baha personally laid the cornerstone for the Baha'i House of Worship in Wilmette, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. That cornerstone is part of the foundation of the House of Worship today. During Abdul Baha's stay in Chicago at the Plaza Hotel, it became a matter of frequent occurrence for him to take a morning or evening stroll in Lincoln Park, where lawns and wooded woods extended northward from the hotel for several miles along the shore of Lake Michigan. On these occasions, it was usual for, for him to accept the escort of any of the friends who might have the good fortune to be on hand and at leisure at the time of starting. On May 5th, he addressed a large gathering at the Plymouth Congregational Church in Chicago. In September, he went to Montreal and stayed at the home of William Sutherland Maxwell, a prominent Canadian architect, and his wife, Mae Maxwell. Their home has since become the, ba the only Baha'i shrine in Canada. Abdul Baha gave eight public addresses and seven informal presentations while in Montreal. He spoke on September 1st at the Unitarian Church of the Messiah, which Sutherland Maxwell designed seven years earlier. A few days later, he spoke at the St. James United Church. Later, he had a visit from the Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Montreal. He came to express his admiration and gratitude for the Master's address concerning the purpose of the appearance of, his, of Christ and other manifestations. He wanted to know about other meetings and talks Abdul Baha was having. The Master replied, Tonight I shall speak at the Methodist Church. You may come if you wish. Abdul Baha's visit to Montreal provided notable newspaper coverage. Altogether, some accounts of his talks and trips would reach over 440,000 people in both French and English publications. He traveled through several cities en route to the west coast of the US. He visited the Mormon Tabernacle in Salt Lake City. And while they were having their annual Mormon convention, Abdul Baha was reported to have said, they built me a temple, but they will not let me in. While in California, at the insistence of Phoebe Hurst, he stayed at her home, Hacienda del Pozo de Verona, Hearst the Hearst estate near Pe uh, Pleasanton from October 13th to October 16th. While in San Francisco, he spoke at Stanford University. The headlines in the Palo Alto super, uh, newspaper read, Abdul Baha, the Baha'i prophet, speaks at Stanford University. A great assembly of students and teachers crowded the auditorium to hear the Baha'i prophet of Persia expound the doctrine of a new day for universal brotherhood, international peace, and religious unity. On his way back across America, he spoke at the Washington Hebrew Congregation Temple. He also spoke at the Unitarian Church in Baltimore and, a, and to a suffragette group in New York speaking about the equality of women and men. He gave multiple talks wherever he went. Back to Great Britain, he then spoke to the Women's Freedom League. And at the University of Edinburgh, he spoke to students in several colleges. In Woking, England, Abdul Baha spoke at one of the only two mosques in England at the time. The mosque in Woking was used only for special events. Abdul Baha was greeted on behalf of all the visitors by the Right Honorable Lord Lamington and the Right Honorable Amir Ali. Abdul Baha spoke on the essential unity of humankind, 
and of all the religions. While in Vienna, he met with the Turkish ambassador and the Persian minister on multiple occasions. Several times he spoke to Theosophist societies. He met with the first woman, Bertha von Suttner, to win the Nobel Prize. She was a leading figure in the peace movement. From Vienna, Abdu'l-Bahá returned to Paris and then traveled on to meet with friends in Stuttgart, Germany. There is a memorial in Stuttgart commemorating his visit. The original memorial was erected in 1916, but removed in 1937 at a time when the Baha'i faith was outlawed by the Nazis. A new plaque was erected in 2007. He finally returned to the Holy Land and to Haifa on December 5th, 1913. During World War I, Abdul Baha was in Palestine and unable to travel. His final years and his passing. The end of the war brought about several political developments that Abdul Baha commented on. The League of Nations, formed in January 1920, represented the first attempt at a global order through a worldwide organization. Abdu'l-Bahá has written, had written in 1875 for the need to establish a union of the nations of the world. And he praised the attempt through the League of Nations as an important step towards the goal. But he also said that it was incapable of establishing universal peace because it did not represent all nations and had only trivial power over its member states. Around the same time, the British mandate supporting the ongoing immigration of Jews to Palestine. Abla Baha mentioned the immigration as a fulfillment of prophecy and encouraged the Zionists to develop the land and elevate the country for all its inhabitants. They must not work to separate the Jews from others, he said. The war had left Palestine in famine. In 1901, Abdu'l-Bahá had purchased 1,704 acres of scrub land near the Jordan River. Many Baha'is from Iran began sharecropping, and Abdu'l-Bahá would receive 20 to 35 percent of the harvest, which was shipped to Haifa. He distributed large amounts of wheat right after the British captured Palestine, and this wheat allayed the famine. For this service, Abdu'l-Bahá was knighted in a ceremony at the home of the British governor in April 1920. He never used his title. When Abdu'l-Bahá passed away November 28, 1921, Winston Churchill telegraphed the High Commission for Palestine his condolences on behalf of His Majesty's government. Several messages came from many others, Viscount Allenby, General Sir Arthur Money, High Commissioner Sir Herbert Samuel, Governor Sir Ronald Storrs, and others. More than 10,000 mourners attended his funeral, the like of which Palestine had never seen, with representatives from so many nations, races, and religions. The future. Um... The shrine of Abdu'l-Bahá is currently being built now between Akka and Baji to honor one who was the center of Baha'u'lláh's covenant, the exemplar of Baha'u'lláh's teachings, the interpreter of the word of the mightiest divine dispensation. As we celebrate his life, at the time of this um, presentation, construction crews in the Holy Land are raising a beautiful overarching structure to hold his blessed remains. Abdu'l-Bahá himself expressed his wish to be buried beneath the path tread by the feet of the early pilgrims on their way from Akka to Baji. So now we'll just view the construction work that's going on.
Thank you for watching.